really push us forward and bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and under His shade and mercy. And Surah Al-Kahf subhanAllah is one of the most powerful surahs in the Qur'an because we read it all the time. And when people, if you ask a child, why do we read Surah Al-Kahf every Friday? A lot of you will tell them, uh, my parents told me to do so, all right? And really, there's a hadith from the Prophet wasallam where it's narrated that if you memorize the first 10 ayahs of Surah Al-Kahf, then it will protect you from Masih al-Dajjal. And, and in another narration, if you memorize the last 10 ayahs of Surah Al-Kahf, then they will protect you from Masih al-Dajjal. And we really read Surah Al-Kahf on Fridays because it protects us from Masih al-Dajjal. But why is the Masih al-Dajjal, the false messiah, such a big threat? What scholars have said, the problem is that Masih al-Dajjal comes with so many fitan, so many trials and tribulations, and that Surah Al-Kahf talks about all these trials and tribulations. And the scholars said that they are four. And those four trials, those four main trials, are evident in the four main stories in Surah Al-Kahf. The first main story in Surah Al-Kahf is the story of the people of the cave. And the people of the cave their main trial was what? They were tried with oppression. They were tried with uh, force and uh, peer pressure. The second one comes in the story of uh, the man who owned the two gardens. What was his trial? His trial was wealth and children. And he thought that this wealth and children protected him from everything, and that he did not need Allah Azza wa Jal. The third trial was in the story of Musa alayhi salam. It is narrated that Musa alayhi salam went on a member, such as the one I'm on, in front of his people, and he told them, I am the most knowledgeable human being. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show Musa alayhi salam that there is someone more knowledgeable. And we know the story of Al-Khidr, of the good man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us the story of Musa through. And lastly, the fourth trial is authority and power. And we see this in the story of Dhul Qarnayn. In the story of Dhul Qarnayn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested Dhul Qarnayn with authority, with immense authority and immense power. And it's from the Sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal that in Surah Al-Kahf, you know, in many stories we see how a, a group of people, they behaved in a bad way and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala perished them, right? We hear the story of Ad and Thamud and even the people of Musa alayhi salam where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala made them get lost for 40 years. But in Surah Al-Kahf, SubhanAllah, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala talks about four, uh, in these four stories, in these four fitan, the proper course of action that one needs to take to avoid these fitna. So we said the first fitna is peer pressure and oppression. When Ashab al-Kahf, they were fearful for their lives and they were being oppressed because they were saying that there's only one God but, and there's only one God and that's Allah Azza wa Jal. He, they said, what, what should they do? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us that the solution to this peer pressure and oppression was that they seek refuge in the cave, that they stay away from this pressure. They stay away from this oppression to the best of their abilities. And we see this in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. When the Muslims had reached a point where they were oppressed so much in Mecca, they were asked to do hijrah. Hijrah was not an option, it was obligatory amongst the believers who could, right? And so this is the first fitna. The second one is of wealth and power. Oh, sorry, wealth and children. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is from His mercy to the man who owned the two gardens that He burned that garden in this dunya. Because if He had not done that and if the man had not seen the light, then He would have been punished in the hereafter. So what was the solution for that person? The solution for them was that they spend in the way of Allah Azza wa Jal and that they 
uh, you know, and that they recognize the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon them. This example is one of a, a very important example because this is one of the cases where something that you could perceive as a blessing is actually a test. You know, a lot of us, we know, all as Muslims, we know that we are going to be tested. And every person will be tested to their abilities. But sometimes that blessing is the test. That you're living in uh, an air-conditioned world, that you have food for iftar, and that we are blessed in so many ways. And if we do not recognize that this blessing is the test, and that if we do not spend it in the way of Allah Azza wa Jal, then we'll be caught in the crossfire. The third one is the story of Musa alayhi salam. And this is where knowledge is a test. You know, how many people have known someone in their lives where you speak to them and they belittle you? Or they think that you are not of their caliber? because they're so knowledgeable, or they know something so much. You know, whether they're, they have a lot of experience in their business, or they have a lot of experience academically, or have a, a lot of knowledge in general, and they think that that knowledge makes them better than the person in front of them. You know, Muhammad وسلم, was extremely knowledgeable, was he not? He received the direct revelation and yet the companions did not feel any shame in asking the Prophet Sallallahu things, even if they would, would, now we would consider them as, oh, that's a dumb question. In fact, the companions asked the thing, everything that they saw that they wanted to ask, and that's why we know so many things. Because the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi explaining things to them, and the, they did not get that sense of arrogance. And so knowledge is a test. You can get knowledge, but unless you realize that if I use this knowledge for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, and for the sake of becoming a better person and getting close to Allah Azza wa Jal, then knowledge can take us away from Allah Azza wa Jal. And the fourth one is power and authority. We all know how power and authority can corrupt. And in this case, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala wanted to show an example of how power could be used in the correct sense. He used cooperation of the people around him. What did the Quran say? فَأَعِينُونِي بِقُوَّةٍ Help me with strength. And this is something that you should take and consider in your life. You might not become a president or some major leader, but you are all responsible. The Prophet ﷺ said, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُونٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ You're all responsible. You're all almost like shepherds. And you're all responsible for your flock. You're responsible for your family. You're responsible for the people who are close to you, your friends. These people allow you an opportunity to really recognize the authority and power that you have. So recognizing these four fitan will help protect you from the fitna of Masih al-Dajjal and actually really improve your place in this dunya. Surah al-Kahf also contains something very important when you look at these four stories. They show you someone who came from a place of weakness to ultimate strength. Surah Al-Kahf actually came at a time when it was revealed when the Muslims were being persecuted. And the, the Muslims at the time saw that this surah contained lessons for how Muslims should behave in every situation. So we know from the story of Ashab Al-Kahf, the people of the cave, that they are weak. And what is the behavior of people who are weak? Do they say, okay, you know what? We're just going to charge in and we're going to attack anyone who speaks against us. No, that was not their behavior. When you are in that position, you seek refuge. And you make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects you. 
When you're in a position of weakness, you seek refuge. So what did the companions do when they heard these ayahs? And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command? That they go and seek refuge in Abyssinia or Ethiopia. Why? Because that's the lesson. You are right now in a position of weakness. Back at that time, a lot of the Muslims were being persecuted and Al Yasir were being tortured. Sumayya radiallahu anha was the first martyr of Islam. And the Prophet وسلم, when he would see them get tortured and he does not have the ability to stop them, he would say, have patience, your reward is Jannah, Al Yasir. Have patience, Al Yasir, your reward is Jannah. Contrast that with Medina, when the Prophet وسلم, now had authority. And a, a Muslim woman was in the market and a Jew in the market asked her or told her, take off your veil. And she said, I'm not going to take off my veil. And so he devised a contraption so that when she got up, her veil was forcibly removed. The Prophet ﷺ did not accept this action whatsoever. And he raided Banu Qaynuqa, who had a treaty with him. That this behavior is unacceptable. Now you have authority, now you have responsibility. So now we saw in Surah Al-Kahf, in the, in the people of the cave, how to deal when you're in a moment of weakness. When you're in a moment of weakness, you seek refuge. If you're around a bad group of people, and you do not have the influence or the power to alter your, your, yourself, then you leave that situation and exit it to the best of your abilities. What if you're at equal levels? So this was the case of the man who had the two gardens. The person, even though his neighbor was poor and didn't have those gardens, he was at an equal footing. And so what do you do at an equal footing? Do you say, this is not my problem, you know, that person is going to Jahannam, that's not my deal. Do you say, you know what, I'm just going to take his gardens because he's not a grateful person. The answer is no to either of them. The answer was to have a conversation with the other person. So when you're in an organization, you have a neighbor, you have a sibling, you have a, a son or a daughter, you have a conversation with them. And this is actually the word that was, that was the only word that was repeated in that story twice. It's the word of conversation. That you need to have a conversation with that person when you're at an equal footing. The third one is Musa السلام, And we saw how Musa السلام, was given advice, right? And patience, and was told to be patient. When you reach that level where you have two people who are mindful of Allah Azza wa Jal, and they want to do what's best, then they need to have that patience with one another. They might not see something immediately. They might not understand why they have to do something at that moment. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, have patience. And be patient of the outcome, even if you don't see it. You know, in the Battle of Uhud, there was a rumor that spread that the Prophet sallallahu was killed. So some companions said, you know what, we should go back. We've lost the battle. The Prophet ﷺ passed away. Other companions said, no. Are we fighting for the Prophet ﷺ or are we fighting for Islam? And they said, go ahead. Charge ahead. And many of those companions passed away. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had willed it that the Prophet ﷺ would pass away in the battle of Uhud, then that would have been the complete religion. You don't decide when the religion comes and when does it stop. And lastly, Dhul Qurnayn with the authority. Yeah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us closer to Him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, you know, get, grant us Jannah and make us from those who succeed 
in this month of Ramadan.